but uh, thank you for coming to this event. Uh, I'm Sean Flynn from uh, Pidgeup at American University. I'll be our master of ceremonies. And um, let me just give you a, a, a couple notes on how we're gonna um, run the program. So uh, first of all, uh, as you can see, we host this event in a seminar format um, instead of a webinar, which means everybody is gonna be in the same room. And the purpose of that is to help facilitate uh, a communal discussion in the audience participation part. However, since there's so many, it will help the, the first part of the event if you actually leave your cameras off if you're an audience member and leave your cameras on if you're a panelist. And that way we'll all be um, on, the, on the same screen together. When we move into audience participation, we welcome you to turn your camera on, especially if you wanna ask a question so we can have a little bit of a to and fro and, and see who's speaking. Um, second, we record this event um, and all of the event, uh, events in our lecture series. We do quite a number of these IP speaker series each semester. I think we did over 20 last semester and all of them are on our uh, PIDGIP uh, events page and you're welcome to use them. They're all Creative Commons licensed, so you can use them in your classes. You can edit them as you wish. Um, third, if you need captioning today, uh, captioning is being provided. There's a little CC button on the bottom of your screen. I believe we've set it to automatically be on. You can also turn it off if that is distracting you. Um, and finally, you're welcome to use the chat function to discuss with other participants and, and perhaps the panelists while the speakers are speaking but we explicitly instruct the speakers to try to ignore the chat as much as possible while they're speaking so as to not be distracted. So I'll be watching the chat as the moderator and I'll try to bring issues um, that you raise there into our discussion. But if you have an issue you really want to ask the speakers themselves, please do bring that up um, during the audience participation part of the event. So this um, event is scheduled in uh, formal on the record uh, uh, proceedings for the first 90 minutes, um, and it will be posted to our webpage after. After that time, I'll turn off the camera and um, continue an informal session for about 30 more minutes. And you're welcome to ask more questions during that session, but in the final, in that final 30 minutes, if we um, move to a Chatham House rule format, which means that you may not, it's not on the record, you may not attribute uh, any statements to any of the speakers, whether they be questioners um, or people answering. So sometimes some of our participants, especially if you're in government, et cetera, may find that a more uh, conducive format to uh, make your comments. And if so, you're, you're welcome to save your comments into that, that part of the session. So with that, I am just gonna start the recording and I see someone already started. Okay, <laughs> so we've already started the recording. And so I wanna more formally welcome you. Thank you all for joining us. This latest edition of Pidgeup's Intellectual Property Speaker Series. Pidgeup sponsors a large number of speakers every semester towards its goal of fostering a robust intellectual environment and promoting evidence-based policy through the dissemination of research. All of our events are recorded and past events can be viewed at our events archive at www.pijip, that's P-I-J-I-P dot org. Today's speaker series is co-sponsored by the South Center who commissioned and published today's report and by the American branch of the International Law Association who's providing several of today's panelists. We are pleased to welcome over 200 registrants to today's events from 43 different countries, stretching over 19 time zones. It's 7 a.m. Friday morning in California where some of our participants are, and it's 2 a.m. on Saturday in Australia where other of our participants are. So we hope they have all uh, are all able to come, um, but it is a, a fairly odd time in, in some of the places. Um, I'm pleased uh, to welcome back to us a longtime member of our academic networks, Henning Grosser's Khan, who's now professor of international and European uh, intellectual property law at the University of Cambridge, and a new member to our community, Dr. Frederica Padu, who hails from Venezuela originally and is currently the Derek Boet Fellow of Law 
in Queens College, Cambridge. Henning and Frederica will present their newly published South Center report, considering legal defenses available to states implementing a TRIPS waiver decision in light of possibly conflicting commitments to protect IP under international intellectual property, free trade and investment treaties. Following the presentation of their report, we'll have a roundtable discussion with eminent scholars and practitioners in the field. That will include um, the panel you see before you, Daniel Aribe, uh, the lead program officer at South Center, Professor Rochelle Dreyfus, the Pauline Newman Professor of Law at NYU Law School, Professor Holger Hestemeyer, Professor of International and EU Law at King's College London, Professor Peter Yu, Regents Professor of Law, um, of Law and Communication and Director of the Center for Law and Intellectual Property at Texas A&M University, and Nirmala Siam, Program Officer at South Center. And so we'll have a bit of a, a free form roundtable with those participants. And after that roundtable discussion, I'll invite all of us to turn our cameras on and join um, in a, a discussion with the audience. And that will be followed by an informal reception, virtually, unfortunately, or fortunately, since we can have so many people at the same time. So with that, Henning and Frederica, welcome again, and we welcome your presentation. My understanding, I think, is that Henning's going first. Is that right, Henning? Okay. Yeah, so that, Henning, that, 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 that's right, Sean. And uh, thank you so much um, for organizing this event. Um, I also want to thank the, the South Center um, and Viviana in particular. I'm not sure if you're here, but um, for, for sort of supporting uh, the drafting of this report. Uh, and of course, mostly I want to thank Federica for uh, helping me so much with uh, well, coming up to this particular report, and we look forward to discussing it with you. Um, let me start sharing my screen. I hope that's going to work as good as it did a couple of moments ago. Um, right, so I hope now you can see my screen. Sean, if you can give me a quick sort of hands up. That, yeah, excellent. Well, so um, the report we did for the South Center um, is on the topic of the impact of a TRIPS COVID waiver on trade and investment agreements, asking uh, states who have committed to these agreements to protect intellectual property. Uh, Federica and I will present uh, the report. I'll try to sort of limit myself to 15 minutes. I'll try, try to cover the first four points here in this particular report. And Federica is a, as a sort of expert in general international law, in particular, the law of defenses, and state responsibility is going to deal with point number five. Now, obviously, um, well, all of these points, uh, each of them, I suppose, especially number three and four and five, well, number two perhaps as well, will uh, or could sort of engage uh, hours of discussion. So what I'm trying to do is to provide some sort of a bird's eye overview. And then in the ensuing discussion later on with the comments from the experts and from you, the audience, we can perhaps take up more specific points. Um, if you have questions about that, you can always also write to Federica and myself, at least I guess should just speak for, for myself here <laughs> to me. If you have particular comments, I'll, I'll welcome them um, and uh, welcome to hear from you on, on that. So as you see from the outline here, I'm going to begin saying a little bit about what the TRIPS waiver is and what it allows. I'm not really going to discuss at all the policy about whether it does or doesn't make sense to have it and what it can or cannot achieve in the current context in particular. Um, and then we're going to look at um, commitments under other international intellectual property and investment treaties and the extent to which they overlap or interfere with and maybe even prevent to some extent uh, a country from implementing the TRIPS COVID waiver. So that is going to uh, come in, in, in three parts effectively, what, what um, my discussion concerns, namely looking first at the multilateral treaties, um, then looking at IP chapters and free trade agreements, and then looking at intellectual property protection under international investment agreements. And then I'll hand over, as I mentioned, to Federica to look at general defenses uh, in international law. Okay, so to begin then, um, the basic assumption for us is that the waiver as proposed uh, 
by, um, well, a range of countries you see here from the African group, uh, South Africa and I think India were quite in instrumental in uh, putting forward the, the uh, decision text, which seems to be uh, the most recent version. Um, that is from May 2021. Um, and we are uh, looking at um, the TRIPS waiver in this particular proposed format, and we assume that it's been agreed and on that basis, look at whether and the extent to which uh, it um, you know, over, overlaps and perhaps interferes with other international commitments to protect intellectual property. So that's, that's sort of our starting point. And then uh, in terms of, well, looking a little bit at not so much the legal nature of the TRIPS waiver, that's an open question. Maybe we can discuss that later at some point, but the substance of the waiver, what does this particular waiver allow? And here I'm quoting from the text of that proposal from May, 2021. Um, and in, in that sense, in, in our view, the waiver has essentially two functions. It's an end in itself and it's a means to an end. And it's an end in itself in that it um, allows members of the WTO uh, to waive protections or commitments to protect intellectual property under particular sections of part two of the TRIPS agreement and the related enforcement commitments under part three. So it's waiving the commitments to comply with the TRIPS agreement in that regard. That's the core sort of, you know, uh, decision taken in form of a waiver. Um, and you see that here in the second paragraph. In addition to that, and I think that follows essentially from the preamble of the waiver, um, the waiver that essentially is a means to an end, namely a means to an end to allow parties, WTO members, to aim for unimpeded, timely, secure access to quality, safe, efficacious, and affordable health product for a rapid and effective response to the COVID pandemic. And in that sense, it's a it's a means to an end to facilitate access to medicines if you want to sort of break it down in a, into a, a brief formula. And so here, that's just sort of summarizing what I've just said. The, the TRIPS waiver has these two functions to suspend TRIPS commitments and to permit WTO members to adopt dom domestic measures that implement the waiver. Because without just with the first um, idea of suspending specifically TRIPS, you wouldn't be able to achieve the particular goal which you can derive from looking at what uh, the intentions of the WTO members or the WTO as an organization, depending on how you look, the legal nature of the waiver is. Um, and in that sense, that is sort of how we look at the waiver in terms of what it intends to do. And that is quite important for the further analysis, um, uh, which I will sort of begin with now. So with that in mind, the key question um, I'm gonna be looking at is how the TRIPS waiver relates to other commitments, other international commitments to protect intellectual property rights. And I'm gonna start with other multilateral treaties um, uh, in the context of WIPO in particular, uh, which uh, require the protection of intellectual property rights. So these are IP specific treaties with, which I'm focusing on. And here I want to distinguish between treaties which are specifically referenced in the TRIPS agreement and other multilateral, usually post-TRIPS treaties. So if I start with number one, this, the treaty specifically referenced in TRIPS. So there you can distinguish between, for example, the Berne Convention, uh, and there's a commitment under Article 9, Section 1 of the TRIPS agreement to comply with, uh, for, for WTO members to comply with Articles 1 to 21 of the Berne Convention. Now that is in part two, uh, section one of the TRIPS agreement, and thereby is within a section of TRIPS, which has been waived. So the commitment to comply with Bern in that sense is waived if the waiver is adopted as is. Um, and then when it comes to the reference to the Paris Convention, which you find in article two, section one of the TRIPS agreement. So there's a commitment for all WTO members to comply with the Paris Convention, articles one to 12. Now that's in, uh, in a part of uh, the TRIPS agreement, which is not being waived. So in principle, uh, at least sort of from the technical um, legal um, scope of the waiver, there is no direct 
waiving of the commitment to comply with the Paris Convention. Now, there can be a further debate we, I'm not going to go into, but we're, I'm happy to elaborate on that, uh, because Article 2, Section 1 TRIPS refers to a commitment to comply with the Paris Convention as regards to matters addressed in Parts 2, 3, and so on of the TRIPS Agreement. And of course, protection under Part 2 and enforcement commitments under Part 3 are, in fact, waived, waived uh, under the waiver. So there might be a question of what exactly uh, remains uh, under under Article 2.1 in terms of a commitment to comply with the Paris Convention. That's an open question to some extent. Um, but, and that's perhaps more importantly, of course, in addition to the reference in TRIPS to the Berne and the Paris Convention, WTO members are independently, or most of them at least, bound by the Berne and Paris Conventions because they're contracting parties to these international treaties. And Article 2, Section 2 TRIPS, for example, makes clear that nothing in TRIPS, doesn't directly address the waiver, but it says that nothing in TRIPS um, derogates from existing obligations under these commitments. So, and then that has, for example, been interpreted in the EC Banana uh, case, EC Banana's case arbitration as where it was about suspending commitments with regard um, to um, uh, countermeasures, where it was about the ability to su suspend uh, commitments under the TRIPS agreement in order to induce compliance of another country to uh, uh, meet its WTO obligations. In that context, uh, the arbitrators in that report have indicated that Article 2, Section 2 makes clear that uh, a, an authority to suspend, in the context of dispute settlement at least, does not, including for reasons of Article 2, Section 2, affect the independent commitments under other international agreements, including the Berne or Paris Convention. So in principle, these commitments stand, but that needs to be qualified with points I'm going to make in a, in a moment. Um, and that the same, of course, apply under point two with regard to other multilateral intellectual property treaties to which TRIPS has no particular reference or other sort of textual um, commitment to comply with. So take, for example, the WIFO Copyright Treaty, uh, the, that is a post-TRIPS treaty. Obviously, TRIPS doesn't say anything about that treaty. And in, so in that sense, uh, the, the TRIPS waiver formally can't, in that sense, directly apply to these particular post-TRIPS treaties. Um, before one then wants to sort of look at, um, uh, or well, put it that way, the, the main question which arises from these um, multilateral treaty commitments, which continue in principle to exist under these other treaties, requiring protection of intellectual property is whether a domestic measure which implements the waiver um, actually violates any of these treaty rules. So is there, for example, a measure which uh, requires um, uh, to um, not protect patent rights or copyrights or other types of IP rights in a way which would lead to a breach of a particular treaty commitment? And if that is the case, there's a further question whether any internal defenses within the treaty regime or external defenses, for example, under the rules of state responsibility apply. Now, I'm not going to go through individual examples here, but I, I'd say that for most of these particular um, uh, pre-TRIPS treaties, um, especially under the Paris Convention, there isn't, because of the nature of the commitments made thereunder, usually I think a strong likelihood that um, uh, such commitments will be violated in a way that one would have to continue to look at a state responsibility. But, but of course, that depends on, very much on the individual measure a country takes to implement the waiver, and it further also depends on the particular treaty commitments. Right, then moving on to looking at intellectual property chapters and free trade agreements. Um, now here, um, I want to distinguish between uh, the types of commitments to protect intellectual property and limits in free trade agreements or exceptions and flexibilities with regard to the usual, the additional commitments made on the protection of IP in these treaties. So when you, under the first point, again, you can distinguish between um, FTA commitments, which more or less reiterate existing TRIPS commitments, uh, for example, in relation to the three-step test for, in copyright or maybe even in patent law or trademark law for exceptions and limitations, Often that's just a reiteration rather than a significant change um, of the text of 
what we already have in TRIPS. And then, of course, we also have lots of provisions or commitments which go beyond the TRIPS agreement, so TRIPS Plus, in that, that they simply uh, add to existing commitments in, in, in TRIPS. And you could look at test data exclusivity rather than protecting test data against unfair commercial use under the TRIPS agreement as a form of TRIPS Plus, or you could look at trade secrets uh, uh, um, protection and FDAs uh, introducing TRIPS Plus commitments in that regard or enforcement related commitments. And then there may be so-called TRIPS extra commitments uh, such as patent linkage or uh, supplementary protection certificates or patent term extensions, uh, where sometimes one might say that isn't really at all addressed in TRIPS and therefore the commitment is sort of outside of TRIPS. But in any case, these additional commitments can easily often be somewhat at issue if a country introduces measures to implement the waiver. Now, so there could be situations where uh, depending on the individual implementation measure, these kinds of commitments are being potentially violated. Uh, and of course, as I said, that would also depend very much on the exact wording of these TRIPS plus or TRIPS extra uh, commitments in FTAs. Now then, however, you would have to look at what kind of limits within the FTA regime exists. And here, I think importantly, one has to uh, appreciate how many, diff how many, not all, but a significant amount of free trade agreements, and we look at lots of examples in the report, uh, contain clauses which defer to TRIPS flexibilities, in particular on matters of access to medicines, and in particular to the flexibilities highlighted in the Doha Declaration. So in that sense, we would argue that the TRIPS waiver can be seen as a form of a TRIPS flexibility, which similar to paragraph four of the Doha Declaration, where basically WTO members agree that um, despite commitments under TRIPS, uh, WTO members retain the right to protect public health. So it's a, an expression of the general international law right to regulate. And in that sense, the TRIPS waiver is a particular expression of that right to regulate. So one would, in, an, in general, and I'm sort of generalizing quite a bit here, and it depends very much on the individual clauses, but I don't have the time to go into these clauses at this point. One would often, I think, find an argument that these types of TRIPS flexibility clauses eventually include possibly the waiver as well as a form of a TRIPS flexibility, in particular, as we understand the waiver as a sort of not only an end in itself, but a means to, to an end as well. In addition, then you can also, and that is uh, equally valid for the last point I made, make an argument of interpreting FTA clauses, commitments, but also these flexibility clauses in light of the TRIPS waiver under general international law notions such as systemic integration uh, and uh, harmonious interpretation and coherence in international law. Right, uh, I'm kind of conscious of time, so I'm just going to briefly introduce the question of protecting intellectual property under international investment agreements, and then I'm going to move on to Federica. Um, so when we look at how international investment law protects intellectual property rights, most of you would know that most types of bilateral investment agreements or uh, investment chapters in FDAs include intellectual property rights within the definition of what constitutes possibly a, a protected investment. But we also probably have to acknowledge that merely holding an IP right might not, not necessarily be sufficient for that right uh, as such, especially if it's just a registered right or even a right uh, arising automatically uh, being protected as an investment if the investor has beyond that not really uh, any form of engagement in the host state. Now, so the, the first question is whether there is at all a protected investment in form of an intellectual property right or where the IP right is part of that sort of protected investment um, in, in terms of how the investor engages in the host state. Um, now then, on that basis, if there is such a protected investment, uh, the key question would be whether in especially investor state dispute settlement proceedings, which um, as most of you would, uh, I think, you know, uh, investors can bring directly against the host state without the need for the home state of the investor to support that in any way. So the private party, the investor has a direct right to sue the host state in these proceedings. Now then IP owning investors could, for example, claim 
a breach of the fair and equitable treatment standard or that there, uh, there is a breach of the expropriation clauses vis-a-vis -vis the types of measures implementing a TRIPS waiver. And again, I, I don't have time to provide concrete examples. They are in the report and we can discuss them maybe later on, but there may well be situations where such a potential for a claim arises and then the, uh, in, uh, if that is being uh, made in an ISDS proceeding, then the tribunal tasked with deciding this matter would have to look into that. But also here you have to look into the internal exceptions and limits to that uh, kind of protection of and equitable treatment or against expropriation. And in particular, one has to acknowledge the right to regulate, which especially in more recent investment treaties has been explicitly included. Uh, in other older investment treaties, we have at least case law or uh, uh, awards suggesting that it can be read into the standards of protection, for example, the expropriation clause. The key question here, in my view, would be, of course, what the individual investment treaty actually says and what kind of deferential standard or not the investment tribunal is willing to apply when it comes to uh, the whole state making decisions, balancing public health with private rights of investors, including IP rights. But lastly, one also has to acknowledge that some, not all, but some um, investment agreements have similar kind of clauses, which I already mentioned in, the, um, uh, in, in, in relation to FDAs, namely which reaffirm TRIPS flexibilities and kind of indicate that when it comes to specifically acknowledged flexibilities, investment law seems to defer to TRIPS as a lex specialis. And again, you could read the waiver into that. So I'll leave it at that and um, stop my presentation at this point. And sorry for overrunning, I guess, to some extent, but I'll hand over to Federica now. Thank you very much. Um, OK, thanks, Henning. Um, I'd like to echo to start with Henning's thanks to the organizers and to commentators. And thank you all as well for allowing a general international lawyer to interloper into this IP discussion. Uh, it's certainly been a most enriching experience for me so far, so thanks to Henning as well for including me in this project. Um, so I will try to share my screen. I'm not very technologically savvy, so I will say that in advance, um, but it seems that we're here. And can you see it? Is it fine? Okay, so, um, all right. So we turn to the general defenses in international law, as Henning mentioned. Um, and we only really need to turn to these defenses if all of the mechanisms internal to the relevant treaties that Henning has just described have failed. So I always think of states when they reach for defenses, like they're, they're, they're drowning and just reach for whatever um, plank of wood they can find. And the reason I say this is that these defenses are incredibly hard to invoke. They're drafted in a very, very narrow fashion and they're rarely successful. So we only really get here if anything within the treaty itself, be it an interpretation of the relevant rule in light of other rules of international law or a specific kind of exception inside the treaty isn't sufficient to provide a legal basis for the implementation of the waiver in this case. Now, these defenses are codified in the Articles on State Responsibility um, and they are largely accepted to be part of customer international law. Sorry, I'm not sure why that went into the fifth slide. So here we are. Uh, they are largely accepted to be part of customary international law. Um, there are two defenses that are potentially useful in present circumstances, and these are the state of necessity and the defense of consent. And as Henning said, there is much to be said about these defenses, and I will only really give an overview of each and then spend some time on the sticky points in each of the two defenses. So I will start with the defense of necessity, which is in Article 25 of the ILC Articles. And as you can see from the slide, that is the text of this rule is quite long. Um, in essence, what this defense allows is it permits a state to act in a way that is incompatible with the obligations of that state when it does so to protect an essential interest of the state or of the international community as a whole against a grave and imminent peril when doing so does not impair an essential interest of the other party. Now the defense is excluded if the primary rule precludes the possibility of invoking this defense or if the state has contributed to the situation of necessity. Now this is in essence a 
lesser evils, a consequentialist defense, which is familiar to many domestic lawyers because in fact, um, in many criminal legal systems around the world, the defense of necessity is described in these similar terms. And so basically it allows, it permits the specific conduct in question, even if it breaches an obligation of the state because it reduces overall or net harm by saving an essential interest, which is considered to be superior. Um, sorry. Full screen, sir. Sorry, sorry, Sean, thank you. I said that I was not technologically savvy and this has been laid full for you guys. Um, okay, it's presence. you are in the edit mode, sorry. There, we have it. Is that better? So sorry about that, um, I'm really sorry. Um, okay, so, um, so it's the next slide. Um, so it permits, um, it permits the state to act in a way that is incompatible with its obligations even if that, uh, because, sorry, because that means that it will have produced an overall net, uh, it will have avoided a greater harm in protecting an interest that is essential to the detriment of an interest that is less important or of lesser urgency. Now, this will be an, a difficult defense to raise, certainly not an impossible one, but a difficult one nonetheless. And as far as I am aware, it has only ever been accepted in two circumstances in two cases, the first time in the 1910s in a case involving Venezuela, uh, the French company of Venezuelan railroads, and second time in 2006 in the lg &E arbitration, one of the first arbitrations against after the financial crisis. Um, sorry. So some of its requirements pose don't, do not pose many difficulties, whereas others are likely to be much more difficult to comply with, to meet. So it seems clear that, at least to me, that in this case, the, the interests protected are certainly going to be essential interests. These are the well-being of the population and the maintenance of health um, systems. And these have been accepted, among others, by investment tribunals are being, as being essential interests of the state. Um, and then the, these essential interests are certainly under a grave and imminent peril. I think the data so far on case fatality rates and the likelihood of developing long symptoms from COVID, as well as how it likely it will likely overwhelm hospitals and public healthcare systems is sufficiently robust. Likewise, the interests harmed are likely to be private interests of investors or patent holders, or it will be the interest in compliance with treaties, which is the interest of the other state in question. And these are likely to be held to be of lesser importance. And certainly this is what has been said in investment arbitration on this point. So this aspect of the plea is likely to be met relatively simply. Um, the other element that I think will be met simply is the exclusion by pr primary rules. This is a question of the relevant primary rules, not a question of the defense of necessity. And as far as I can tell from Henning's um, exposition of these various treaties that might be implicated, um, there are no specific provisions that are likely to exclude reliance on necessity um, in this case. So, so far, so simple. Uh, we move, however, to some of the most difficult aspects of this defense, and these are the elements of non-contribution and the requirement of only way. I'll start with non-contribution and then spend a bit more time on the requirement of only way. So according to the commentary to the ILC articles, if a state contributes to the situation of necessity, so the, to the situation causing a grave and imminent peril to the essential interest in question, and this contribution is substantial, which is understood as more than de minimis, then this is enough to exclude reliance on the plea. Now, this is an incredibly broadly drafted requirement, which can include unwitting and good faith policies adopted by the state many decades ago. There is no temporal limitation on when these, um, when these policies might have been taken place. So this is a broad standard. Anything a state does can potentially exclude invocation of the plea. Um, so there has been some pushback against this very strict um, understanding of the plea. And I have here a quote from the Union Fenosa uh, arbitral award, which said to an extent a situation of necessity can always be traced back to history, political and economic mistakes made by a state even decades earlier. And as a result of this, or echoing a similar sentiment, some other tribunals have started imposing certain stricter limitations to this very broad element, um, requiring therefore some temporal proximity between the event that contributes to the situation of necessity 
or even requiring that the contribution be marked by some degree of fault, for example, negligence and negligent uh, policy adopted by the state or in, even worse, um, some kind of intention in that regard. Uh, nevertheless, there is some inconsistency between these later um, awards that have tried to uphold a, a much stricter understanding of this requirement and what the ILC articles and the commentary actually say. So it is not clear exactly how this um, would be applicable in present circumstances. So what kinds of policies adopted by states would be considered as having contributed to the harm posed by the current pandemic. Now, as to the requirement of only way, this is again a very, very strict element and one which James Crawford, who was the final architect of the Articles on State Responsibility um, in his role as the final special rapporteur to the ILC on this topic, he said only means only. Right? It, it's very simple in his view, only means only. And essentially the way the ILC understand this is that any other lawful means, inconvenient or costly as they may be, could exclude reliance on the, P, on the plea. And it, you perhaps might not be surprised to hear that this is in fact one of the elements on which the defense almost always fails. Certainly in investment arbitration, the experience of the various states invoking this defense has been that it is here where their defense tends to fail. Now, there are a number of problems with this particular understanding of the, pre, the plea, and I've, we've sketched some of these out in, in this report, and I've explored some of them at length in some other writings as well. Um, and I will focus only on two of these here. So what does it actually mean for something to be the only way, and how do we assess whether there are any alternatives to that only way? So first, as to only way, when Crawford says only means only, he only tells us about only. He doesn't tell us anything about what way means. Is way here a single measure or is way here a package of measures? And we know from recent crisis, the financial crisis after 2008, the financial crisis in Argentina in the early 2000s, this pandemic, that there is often no single measure that can be taken to address macro crisis like the ones that we have been living through. There is no silver bullet, right? More often than not, a crisis will need to be tackled with a package of measures. And so the question has been, can a package of measures be the only way? The interpretation by international tribunals, in particular investment tribunals, is again inconsistent. There are some tribunals like those in Vivendi, which I have quoted, have mentioned in, this, in the slides there, that have, it, have focused on the specific measure challenge. In that case, it was one of, the challenge, one of the measures that Argentina had adopted as part of a package of measures in response to the financial crisis. And the tribunal simply took that measure in the abstract and asked itself, is this the only way? Inevitably, the answer to that is no, that is not the only way. There is a, an, another way of approaching this question, which is the approach taken by the tribunal in LG&E, and, &E, and they have taken a much broader understanding. Only way essentially for them means doing something. Is this a situation where the state needs to do something? Yes, therefore this criterion is met. This is on itself perhaps a too, too broad an understanding of what only way means. After all, um, it, it is the ILC did intend to establish a relatively narrow and strict defense. And so this broad understanding seems to undermine that desire by the ILC. Now there is a third way um, adopted by the tribunal in Urbacer, which tries to combine these two ways of dealing with the problem. And essentially what they try to do is assess the single measure that is being challenged, but in the context of the package of measure that the state is adopting. And this seems to me to be a more reasonable approach, which retains the narrow spirit of the plea, but at the same time acknowledging the complexity of crisis and not creating artificiality by just addressing one specific measure. However, the matter remains open and it is not entirely clear how other tribunals and whether other tribunals in the future will follow the Orbaser approach. Second is perhaps a more complex problem and is the problems of alternatives. This problem involves often a counterfactual question. Did the state have other measures available to it? Now, as many commentators have noted, it's often easy to find on paper that there were measures that could have been taken at the time and that usually will involve a state or an expert, at, a, a, sorry, a decision maker or an expert asking themselves now whether there were measures back then that could have been taken. Now, unfortunately, this is the way some tribunals have approached the question. 
but if, if the question is approached this way, it is incredibly difficult to say that no alternatives were possible on paper, any alternatives can always be found. And so in my writings, both in this report and in separate writings with my, Professor Michael Weibel, relying on the Enron decision, on the Enron and Olmert decision, we have made a proposal as to how to assess alternative um, measures that are available. And so in our view, an alternative measure can only displace the measures adopted by the state to the extent that that measure is lawful. It is actually feasible and possible for the, the state to adopt the measure at that time. And it is more effective at protecting the interest in question. Because after all, we think if, if the defense is about minimizing net harm, it seems unreasonable to expect that a state will adopt a measure that is lawful, but can only avert 20% of the harm, as opposed to an unlawful measure that is capable of averting 80% of the harm. Why should a state adopt a measure that can save two lives just because it's lawful when it can adopt one that is unlawful but can save eight lives? Now, this characteristic, these criteria, lawfulness, feasibility, and effectiveness are likely to involve really difficult questions that tribunals may need um, to address, um, to con compare and decide whether or not a particular measure is effective. Um, nevertheless, just because it is difficult, there's no reason not to engage in this kind of um, analysis. Now, as you can see from the description of this defense, it is very difficult to invoke, but I am not entirely sure that it is impossible to invoke in respect of measures implementing the waiver. Nevertheless, it is not a sound and solid basis. There is no possibility to predict with any certainty what a tribunal might find in this case. Now, moving on to consent, I see that I have a message saying I have to hurry up, uh, perhaps. Um, sorry, I just talk a lot, so it's very difficult for me to be brief. <laughs> so the next defense is the defense of consent. Um, essentially here, what you would like to do is um, argue that, sorry, I'm trying to close the chat, is argue that the other state that is the right holder has consented to the non-performance of that particular right at that particular time. And so the state that is invoking consent is essentially saying, because of the consent of the other party, I was not obliged at this present moment to comply with that obligation. Correlatively, they might say, I am permitted to engage in this uh, type of behavior. So here, what we would need is for a state to be able to argue that other states' parties to investment treaties, FDAs that contain um, IP protections, or IP treaties themselves have consented to the non-performance of that um, obligation. Now, here is the text of Article 20, which is um, in the ILC articles again, and is recognized as part of customary law. Um, and this analytically is a much less complex defense than state of necessity in the sense that the elements of this defense are relatively simple, both to explain and to identify. Um, but it is more complex to the extent that you're relying on the precise wording and the intention of another state. So the various elements here, again, as I was saying, were simple timing, the consent has to be given before or at the time of the act, namely the waiver would have to be adopted before any state or the consent rather has to be given before any state implements the waiver domestically. The consent has to be valid in the sense that it has to have no defects, things like coercion, corruption, mistake, and so on, which are not likely to arise in the present case. It has to be given by a competent authority, that is someone who is competent according to both international law and the domestic law of the state to some extent, to consent to the non-performance of that obligation. Now, insofar as we're dealing with treaty commitments here, more often than not, a foreign minister will have full capacity to do this according to the law, the law of treaties. But because we're dealing with IP and trade treaties, it is possible that trade ministers might also be uh, competent to give this consent. And these will depend on the specific treaty that we're discussing and on the specific state in question. There are no formalities for the giving of consent, no requirements of form at all. It can be given orally or in writing. It can be informal or formal. It can be expressed or implicit, so long as it is clearly established and it is not presumed. So um, here in particular, in respect of the waiver, the waiver itself could provide for this consent, for example, if it's specifically indicated as much in the preamble, or states could give this consent in any setting. They could give consent to the non-performance of these obligations in the implementation of the waiver, in a, in a news conference, as was evidenced from the nuclear tests case between France, New Zealand, and Australia in the 1970s. It could be given include domestically before parliament, or it could be given in the floor of an international organization, for example, during the discussions leading to the adoption of the waiver. 
Now, it is unlikely that there will be such clear um, consent given by states, but the consent, as I was saying earlier, can also be implicit and it can therefore be inferred by the actions of states and by the statements of states in connection with the adoption of the waiver. Things that they say during the debates in the, on the adoption of the waiver, the specific text of the waiver, things that they say after the adoption of the waiver, all of these things combined can provide the basis to infer consent, so long as it is clear that it is their intention to exclude the application of these specific provisions to any measure that is intended to implement the waiver. Finally, there's a specific question that arises in respect of consent that doesn't arise in respect of necessity and that only arises in respect of investment treaty arbitration. And it is the question whether the consent of the home state can be invoked against the investor. That is, can the home state consent to the non-performance of an obligation, of a right that it owes and that benefits third parties, that is the investors in question. Uh, we address this question in the report at some length, but in essence, our view is that so long as the rights of investors are grafted onto the treaty, that is, so long as the rights of investors are derived from the treaty, they are subject to that state, to their home state's actions in respect of that treaty. Now, it is clear that a state can terminate or suspend a bilateral investment treaty, for example, with the effect that it therefore suspends or terminates the rights of investors under that treaty. So in our view, if, it, if states can do that, then it must necessarily follow that it can also do a lesser act, such as suspending the non-performance of those treaty commitments for a specific set of circumstances. So this is a brief overview of these offenses. I am terribly sorry for all the technological problems. Um, I usually use a board <laughs> with a pen. Um, now, I'm happy to discuss any of these questions in, um, in, in the discussion with the discussants as well as with any of the participants. Uh, thanks again for inviting me to take part in this. I'm, I hope I kept to my time and I, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, tons of uh, food for thought and discussion. It was really interesting to hear you starting to talk about some of the things that countries could actually do to help um, tackle some of these complex legal problems, which maybe can be one of the themes of our, of our discussion going forward. So let, let me turn it over to the panel and I'll, and I'll just take people in the order that we sign them on the website. But let me turn to Daniel first, um, who's representing South Center who helped commission this report. Um, so thank you, Daniel, both for being here, but also for uh, bringing this work to us uh, for your efforts. Thank you very much, Sean, uh, Federica, and Henning. Thank you very much for the great report you wrote. We are really glad for the result and also for the discussion that might have uh, after this uh, publication. So first of all, I would like to thank all of you for the preparation of the report again. I think that is really true also, and it shows what some of the concerns that the South Center has shown even before the actual discussion of, the, of COVID-19. As you know, the South Center has been working on the issue of investment reform for a long time now. And I think that this report is showing some of the stress tests that COVID-19 has posed on the investor state dispute settlement uh, system. On those bases, um, I will uh, focus broadly on the issue of investment agreements. And then uh, my colleague Nemalia will also focus on the FTAs because I think that both of those elements have been, uh, also more or less dealt by the South Center in another paper that the South Center has published written by Nemalia, Professor Correa, Carlos Correa and myself. Uh, on this, I think that um, the report that you prepared clearly identifies uh, two of the most important issues that we can see on the need to reform the investment uh, architecture, international investment architecture, which is one that um, the IIS protections which are granted to investors are actually not requiring any kind of relying in diplomatic protection, nor in the protections given to investors by the domestic system. The, the, the investors can go directly into um, international, the international system in order to defend their own rights. That implies that in one way or another, there is a circumvention of the domestic court, which will undermine the judicial system of the states. Now, that uh, circumventing of the judicial system of the states could be a potential uh, detriment on the application of the TRIPS waiver. Uh, in one way or another, the waiver is allowing the state to adopt any kind of measure, legally, uh, judicial, or political measure, in order to apply or to implement the TRIPS waiver into the domestic system. 
But then if the investor has the potential of circumventing the domestic system to initiate any claim at the international level, then the effectiveness of the TRIPS agreement is put into doubt. Uh, this is important because we have seen that through 2000, from, 2000, from the year 2000 until now, at least 25% of the cases uh, which are brought uh, into in the international investor state dispute settlement uh, mechanisms have actually dealt with countries, with developing countries, facing some type of crisis, economic crisis or political crisis, that require this kind of measures, as Federico was pointing out, that they require certain kind of measures uh, in order to cope with the crisis. Now, COVID-19, as I was mentioning, creates a stress test of the system to see if this system is actually allowing states to adopt these kind of measures. Um, from what we know until the moment, until now, um, as Federico was mentioning, the, 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 the cases in IFDS have been not really constant on either the state have this, the, the right to regulate or they don't have it. So uh, on this um, perspective, I think that there are two elements which I would like to discuss first. Uh, one is the possibility of exceptions to be uh, applied in uh, ISDS claims as a mechanism of defense of the state. Uh, and this is one of the most important elements which uh, we have seen in the paper that we, we have produced as well, where we see that in one way or another, the, hash, the high threshold that has been um, imposed um, with respect to this kind of crisis, the high, the high threshold of the necessity test, the proportionality test, the existence of any kind of other measures, uh, non-discrimination and good faith, those of all of these thresholds that have been imposed by the jurisprudence and decisions of uh, ILDS tribunals have actually um, created an idea that these kind of exceptions, which are included in IIS, the current exceptions, are not actually quite effective. They require a high threshold of the state in order to then uh, be actually protecting the, regu the, 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 the right of the states to regulate. Uh, following this approach, um, I think that there is one important element that has to be considered in regard to the relationship between the TRIPS uh, waiver and the, 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 this kind of exceptions. And it's the recognition of the kind of evidence, scientific evidence, which is coming from decisions taken by the WHO, for example, that could allow states to clearly demonstrate that the exceptions for public health, for example, or national security are necessary in order to attain the objective, which is the protection of human rights and human lives. So I think that that evidence, uh, which is coming, scientific evidence and the scientific standards which are coming and developed by the WHO, WHO could uh, allow qualifying COVID-19, the COVID-19 threat waiver as a need, as an, an imperative and a requirement for the protection of human lives. Uh, another issue uh, which is coming uh, now as um, innovation in the issue of ISDS particularly, is the possible existence of a moratorium on ISDS claims related to, uh, in this case, for example, IPRs, intellectual property rights. Um, this is because even if, uh, as mentioned by, uh, by Henning, there are a certain uh, international investment agreements which have included certain clauses or provisions which allow a better understanding on the right to regulate of the states, the reality is that most of the 3,000 international agreements that are still in existence are actually all generation agreements, where these exceptions are quite limited and require the, compl the, the, the comp uh, compliance with this high threshold of standards. Therefore, um, uh, there has been a big call from different uh, civil society organizations and even from the African Union on the possibility of exploring the establishment of a moratorium on ISDS claims in general related to the COVID-19 measures, uh, but also a broad moratorium for any kind of ISDS measure coming from the time period of ISDS. Right now, we know, for example, that from 2019 to 2020, there are at least 100 new claims which are initiated and not yet uh, finished uh, in ISDS only against states, developing states, only against developing states. We are talking about 100 cases uh, which states have to deal with during a COVID-19 period when, not even, uh, when delegates are not even allowed to travel to go and defend those cases. So we see that uh, the possibility of having a moratorium is quite an interesting approach. 
In this element, uh, for example, there has been the discussion on a temporary suspension of IFDS as one of the mentioned, uh, mentioned by Federica. The possibility of having a consent by the other country of um, not a, a, a applying certain provisions of the I, of, of an international investment agreement dealing with uh, the, in, the, the recognition of IPR rights as protected rights under the investment agreement could be a mechanism to apply uh, this moratorium. Um, for, and, and there are different means and ways in which this is happening. And this is also part of the innovative mechanisms that the states are finding in order to cope with certain of the challenges coming from IFDS. For, for, for example, New Zealand has uh, decided to have certain exchange of letters between different governments establishing that IFDS will not be, will not be applicable in uh, cases involving nationals from those two uh, countries. Similarly, uh, there have been uh, mechanisms in which um, the, under the agreement of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, excluding the possibility of applying IFDS. So we see that this mechanism of consent will be a viable mechanism, an innovative mechanism that could be applicable. One way is, as mentioned by Federica, doing it through the TRIPS uh, waiver itself, including that paragraph, that kind of paragraph into the TRIPS uh, waiver. But at the same time, we are now discussing a WHO pandemic treaty because if the truth waiver is a moment is just temporary based on the existence of the COVID-19 measures and COVID-19 effects, then there is also a possibility of including this to a broader kind of issues, which is a pandemic, any kind of, of, of pandemic. And the discussion in the WHO on the pandemic treaty might be also a mechanism or innovative means to kind of push for this, uh, for this idea of a moratorium. Um, similarly, and this is something that we have been discussing a lot, is uh, the issue of creating a mechanism or means to support the states in time of crisis, independently of what kind of crisis they are coming. And in IPRs, and I think this is something that has been discussed already, the issue of um, these kind of waivers with respect, for example, to climate action, to adaptation and uh, resilience, is an important element to also consider. So how we can uh, 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 extrapolate this kind of uh, experiences coming from the COVID-19 crisis into building resilience for all the type of crisis which might be facing states in the future. And this is part of the highlight that we would like to mention here. Uh, I will not like to go uh, particularly into all of the issues that were discussed already by Federica and the possible uh, means that the states have to defense uh, or for the defense of uh, in, general, in general law. I will just, uh, put in the um, chat the paper that the South Center has also published that can be also a complementary means to read all of these elements. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Professor Dreyfus Rochelle, over to you. Hey, well, uh, thank you very much. Um, I thought uh, the analysis by Frederica and Henning was compelling. Um, and I feel like my role is to play devil's advocate uh, and to question a few points in the analysis rather than to disagree with them uh, in their conclusions. Um, so I'd like to make a few quick points so that we have time for the round table. Uh, so like Daniel, uh, I'm very concerned about investment obligations. Uh, and as I read the report, uh, it seems to me it assumes uh, that an investor's rights are measured from a baseline set by the TRIPS agreement. Uh, that is, the report asks how an investment tribunal would view a national law that exceeds a TRIPS flexibility, but which is nonetheless consistent with the waiver. Uh, but I wonder if TRIPS allowability is the right baseline. Uh, I would think that a complainant uh, would assert that when it invested, it relied on the host state's actual laws, not what the host state could have enacted under the TRIPS agreement. Uh, remember that TRIPS is, sets a minimum standard and are Article 1 permits states to afford more extensive protection uh, than the agreement requires, and many states have more extensive protection. The United States, for example, has consistently refused to enact compulsory licenses. Uh, the Supreme Court has even relied on these multiple rejections when it's interpreted our patent law. Conveniently, it's even listed the occasion. So when Congress has refused to enact compulsory licenses, uh, why does it do that? Because the U.S. views uh, that the risk of a license would reduce incentives to invent. 
Um, it couldn't get an international agreement espousing that view, but its own view is that compulsory licenses might decrease investment. Uh, or take another example, many developed countries opted out of Article 31 bis of the TRIPS agreement. Why? To assure pharmaceutical companies that they'd continue to have large markets from which to earn profits from their discoveries. So I would think that an investment tribunal would consider deviations from that position, not from TRIPS. Uh, or to put it another way, I see how TRIPS might be regarded as setting an investor's minimum set of expectations, but not a ceiling. Uh, and yet the authors explain only why there can be no argument that a state went below those minima. Uh, and even there, there's a bit of a problem because the IIAs mention TRIPS compatibility, but only in specific cases uh, and not mostly in connection with fair and equitable treatment protection. As to FTAs, I have a similar concern. Uh, the systemic integration argument which would have arbitrators ignore deviations from the higher standards set in free trade agreements. I don't know. You know, I agree with everything that Marty Cascamieni has ever said uh, and the International Law Commission's fragmentation reports, but I don't know that arbitrators would agree with that. Uh, after all, the whole point of the FTAs uh, that came after TRIPS is to impose TRIPS plus obligations. And so not clear to me why waiving TRIPS necessarily waives TRIPS plus. Uh, a couple of other concerns about systemic integration. Uh, first, the more far reaching we read this as a waiver, the more it's read to affect all of these other international agreements, the less inclined WTO members will be to enter waivers in the future. Uh, and that's important because waivers are not uncommon ways in which TRIPS disputes have been settled. Um, also, I'd like to know more about what happens when IIAs are suspended. Uh, Frederica referred to that, but uh, I don't know much about what happens then. One worry I've had is about whether investors might then have recourse against their home countries. Uh, that might not be possible everywhere, uh, but in the U.S., waiving a U.S. investor's foreign IP rights, I wonder if it con could constitute a taking under domestic law. Um, and I think back to the Iran hostage crisis, uh, where that kind of argument was made uh, about investments made in Iran. Uh, well, if that's right, um, it's hard to believe that a host country that waived TRIPS obligations actually meant to waive everything else. Uh, because remember, one feature of ISDS for IP is that relief can be pretty astronomical. Uh, and that would be especially true when we're talking about life-saving vaccines and treatments in the middle of a pandemic. That said, um, there are many safeguards and flexibilities in IIAs and uh, in TRIPS, uh, and uh, as for Drikatolas and other parts of international law, including the emphasis uh, and the agreements on the right to regulate, protect public health, the importance of the Doha Declaration on public health, security exceptions, which uh, haven't been mentioned here, uh, and of course, the arguments uh, that Frederica gave about necessity. Uh, and I think these flexibilities may be capacious enough to accommodate the kind of actions uh, that the countries that sought the waiver might wish to undertake. Uh, but those arguments don't rely on the waiver. Uh, an advantage to relying on them is they're not time bound uh, as the waiver might be, and they don't raise questions about what is sufficiently COVID related uh, within the meaning of the waiver uh, to qualify uh, for um, the absence of protection. So those are my comments, um, but in general, I agree with everything that they've said. So thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Rochelle Holger. Thank you so much. So uh, I regard my role as comparable. Uh, I, I think, first of all, uh, much praise uh, to Henning and Federica. You went through an enormous mass of arguments and I just want to add to that math and make basically three simple points. The first one is, um, and uh, you can already see by the mass of information, it would have been impossible to tackle all of these in the report. First one is, what actually type of implementing measures do we expect, do we hope for from the waiver? Because that becomes relevant when you're defending them. And uh, which countries do we expect to act, which countries do we 
hope will act and what type of measures will they actually take? It's very difficult to defend the measures in the abstract when you don't really know what the countries are doing and when you don't know which countries are doing that. And of course, uh, for writing such a report, you don't know, so you can't really say. Uh, there's an intriguing comment in the report regarding the possible scope, a mandate to share confidential knowledge. So that uh, is the first issue here, and that already enlarges the scope of what can and should be discussed. In fact, uh, the report itself already says uh, the, the waiver should probably be clarified with regard to the incorporation of the Paris Convention with regard to part four of TRIPS in the Paris Convention, and I would add possibly also with regard to MFN and national treatment, but that all depends on what measures we would hope for uh, and would expect states to take. The second point I want to make, and it sort of uh, follows naturally from the first, is complexity. The, the report shows what sort of monster we have created with the decline of the multilateral and the rise of bilateralism. And I'll just give you one example. The UK as a country has 38 FTAs in force, according to the WTO database, 90 BITs, and of course, numerous of the WIPO administered treaties. All of the arguments depend on the concrete treaty and on the provisions in the concrete treaty. And the mass of documents allows for the most divergent argument. I quite like the security exception argument, uh, at least an invocation of the security exception in FTAs is here far more realistic than for the US and steel uh, in pandemic time. Uh, but there are also lots of arguments you can use against possible waiver measures. Uh, you can, for example, argue that uh, any TRIPS plus agreement wants to protect IP more strongly than the WTO. So accordingly, any waiver uh, should not be relevant to, let's say, the US-Australia relationship because they want stronger protection uh, of IP. And that's clearly stated in the treaty by creating TRIPS plus obligations. Now, the, whether that convinces arbitrators is difficult to say, but as I said, the mass of documents itself allows for choice of various fora in various different agreements that you invoke. As to the defenses, um, you run into WTO dispute uh, problems, uh, for example, with the uh, ILC article. Uh, the WTO has been very hesitant to actually use them, in particular to defenses. Peru agricultural products cites to Article 20 in the weirdest of ways um, and doesn't really allow for invoking it. But as I said, it's not sufficiently discussed, but it's very likely that any FTA dispute settler would refer to WTO case law. Um, consent, also interesting to see how that works and if IP rights would be regarded as individual rights and allows state consent to suffice, that is also mentioned in the report. Um, so, and harmonious interpretation, if you look at the WTO uh, interpretation of Article 31, para 3C, it has reduced the scope quite significantly from what I would have hoped is possible in that regard. When we come away from trade to investment, uh, things become even more complex because there's not even a central dispute settle settler like the WTO appellate body that gives us any sense of orientation, uh, you have widely contrasting principles, the protection of the investor of the, as the principal goal of such agreements, and then doctrines like police power, right to regulate, which seem to, at least at a very basic level, fundamentally conflict with the uh, pro protection of the investor. So, uh, different cases have handled this conflict rather differently and in uh, very complex situations it would be very difficult to judge and predict what any particular uh, arbitration panel would decide in that regard and i think so so this goes to the complexity of the analysis of any single case 
but the complexity in itself becomes an argument that makes the waiver issue very complex. Because even if you have a waiver, the amount of law, the amount of possible arguments, the contradictory precedent will make it difficult for states to assess at the situation in any concrete case and to properly legislate. And that is the problem that we really have to tackle. And that brings me to my third point. Maybe we should take a step back and look at patent law as it is and as it should be. In any basic patent law class, what you learn is you disclose information. That's part of the deal. You enable others to make the invention. And in return, you get a patent. That apparently is not what happens in reality at, a, at the most fundamental level. There is so much secrecy surrounding any given invention. There's such a patent thicket that even industry itself says, well, you can have the patent, but it won't help you. You can't really do anything with it. That is not what the patent system is meant to do at a fundamental level. At least my understanding is that patents are supposed to teach those skills in the art to make something and not to make something that is fundamentally useless and pointless, but to actually make something that is worthwhile for society. Uh, and I know that this is not how the patent system works at the moment, given the rush to uh, patent anything once you've uh, advanced a little bit in your research. But uh, I question whether this is the system we should have and whether we shouldn't return to a stricter interpretation of patentability requirements actually in compliance with the wording of Article 27 trips, for example. Thank you. Peter. So I want to join uh, my fellow panelists in congratulating uh, Henning and Fabrica in providing a detailed and compelling analysis. Uh, in the interest of time, I will share with you three different reactions, which hopefully will uh, push the project a little bit further or helpful with other projects you're working on. Uh, the first one is about the analysis. Your paper is already very long and with the limited time in the presentation, I suspect you cannot go further into the specific purpose of the waiver. So when I was reading the report, I find the report closer to an IP waiver for public health purposes than a specific waiver for COVID. And I suspect if you dig deeper into a specific purpose of uh, using the waiver to prevent, uh, contain or treat COVID, you actually will have a stronger analysis and a more uh, 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 compelling conclusion by saying that you will not violate some of the commitments. So I, I encourage you to actually look further into that. Uh, because I think this waiver is actually more narrow uh, than what your current analysis uh, have. Uh, the second reaction is about uh, the um, the way you you guys have uh, do the analysis, right? So I, I I I think a number of commentators here, as well as a lot of members of the audience, actually agree with your perspective, and so I think it's easy to go in the same direction. And that's why we do not have a lot of strong disagreement with respect to the waiver. But the immediate reaction I have after reading a paper is that, do we actually need to have the waiver if we take the same broad pro-development, pro-flexibility interpretation of the international agreements? When you think about a TRIPS agreement, uh, if you focus on Article 7, Article 8, Article 7 is free, uh, there are enough provisions where we can actually interpret so broadly that will allow us to achieve what we try to achieve in a waiver. But at the same time, I think a lot of the WTO members are very concerned that that will not be sufficient, right? And I think that ties into uh, what Daniel said earlier about the moratorium uh, beyond the WTO context, in part because I think a lot of countries actually want more certainty. Uh, and so, for example, Article 73, you have to get into issues about whether it would actually satisfy with the requirement about necessity, whether it is um, emergency in international relations, uh, whether it actually uh, will be essential security interest. 
right? With the wafer, you don't need to worry too much about those clarification. And so one question I would have is that, assuming others will not take such a broad interpretation, uh, whether you will still achieve the same result. And if you do take the very broad interpretation, whether we actually need to have the wafer the same way uh, in a TRIPS agreement in light of all the other flexibility. Uh, the last reaction I have is about what will happen on the ground. And I, would, I, I think it will be important for us to actually explore further how we can actually uh, uh, do more in that direction. So uh, the two main concerns I think for a lot of countries uh, in the ISDS context uh, is that they do not want to get dragged into an ISDS dispute. Even if you know that at the very end you prevail, you're still very concerned about the cost of the litigation as well as the fact that you will affect um, uh, investors and how it's going to uh, uh, affect the intentional reputation of the, uh, of the host state. Uh, the other concern is actually directly related to investors, right? Even if they, uh, if they can prevail, some investors may go to other host states and they will lose the investment, right? So a lot of countries are actually taking a wait and see attitude, uh, even if you give them a detailed analysis. I think a very good example would be the plain packaging context. I think enough commentators have shown that uh, the host state will pass muster based on legislation. And yet a lot of countries are still hesitating to introduce similar legislation, fearing about the negative repercussions. I think another good example in the corporate context is about the three-step test. I think there have been a lot of analysis about whether fair use or other limitation exception will actually pass muster under the three-step test. And yet, a lot of legislators are still uh, considering whether this will become an issue at the international level, right? So I think the question uh, that I will push you guys to think a little bit further is how can you project your analysis and try to help people who will still have the hesitation and uh, make it even more effective? And so on that, I'll pass it back to John. And I will pass it to Nirmala. Uh, Nirmala, our last, our last commentator, and then we'll give a round to the speakers to respond. And then I'll turn off the camera and we'll, I think we'll have all the audience discussion in the, uh, in the Chatham House Rules section of the event. Nirmala, to you. Thank you, thank you, Sean. And um, um, I have a, a few very brief uh, points um, and would be interesting to see uh, how um, the authors um, would um, uh, react to um, those. Um, first one was that um, Professor Henning um, mentioned in the, uh, and, and it's there in the paper that um, Article 2 uh, um, of the TRIPS agreement is outside the scope of the waiver and therefore potentially obligations under the Paris Convention would remain outside. I mean, one could argue, as you rightly pointed out, three parts three and four, uh, parts two and three would, uh, are still within the scope of uh, the waiver. But nevertheless, even if one, one takes a very conservative view of it to, to argue that um, the Paris Convention per se um, is outside the scope of the waiver, uh, what would be the implications of that from the perspective of the objectives of the waiver? For example, here we are really, uh, one of the immediate objectives is to look at patents in, in relation to um, uh, pharmaceutical products and vaccines. Um, and the Paris Convention does not mandate um, uh, countries to recognize product patents on, on medicines and vaccines, for example. So can that be a defense anyway to, to invoke that, that even if you go back to a pre-trip understanding of Paris, we, um, we are not therefore violating uh, what, what is there in the Paris Convention, or do we need to carve out any specific um, uh, defense in the text of the waiver in that light? I think that would be uh, uh, something uh, interesting to, to know. Secondly, um, um, just wanted to also understand in terms of the defense uh, uh, um, of the state of necessity and, and the point that was made about uh, the lack of contribution uh, that should be proved uh, by the state to um, invoking the state of necessity to, to that situation. I mean, we know in the context of COVID-19 that there have been several um, phases of, of um, introduction of strict um, uh, regulations and then relaxation of those regulations, emergence of new variants um, and spiking of, of, of the number of infections. We are going through a cycle, um, and, and you know, we're currently in a, in a 
um, in, in one of those phases where phases where in Switzerland we are um, again relaxing um, the regulations. Now the question is, would those acts therefore tantamount to uh, contributory acts of the state, which would essentially um, uh, be uh, amount to a denial of the of, of, of an argument of the state of necessity, weakening that argument, uh, which in, in, as you rightly point out is um, difficult to, uh, to establish because it can be construed very narrowly. Um, and um, another point that I wanted to uh, seek your reaction to is that um, you, will, you may be aware that um, in the WHO, there is the International Health Regulations, which is a, a treaty instrument uh, of a different nature, which is currently applicable to um, uh, the governance of the pandemic. Um, under Article 42 of the International Health Regulations, uh, the recommendations that uh, the WHO makes um, per, uh, under the IHR, uh, would be binding on uh, members of the WHO. Now, for instance, it's, it's, it's a hypothetical question. If the WHO were to issue a temporary recommendation calling for uh, a waiver of intellectual property uh, uh, protection or enforcement, would that, um, uh, uh, can that be invoked as, um, as a defense uh, in the context of implementation of the TRIPS waiver? Um, and in, given the, the uncertainty that we are going through with uh, the waiver negotiations, it's still not agreed to. Would that even in the current context be possibly used uh, uh, to, to repudiate uh, obligations uh, under the TRIPS agreement? Thank you. Super. Now I'm going to turn it over to the two speakers and you can comment on anything you like in response to the panel and then we'll turn it over to the general audience. Okay, maybe just briefly, and I think we will uh, give more time then to the general discussion. So lots of stuff to pick up from, from what Rochelle, Holger, uh, Siam, um, Peter, Nirmala, and uh, Daniel have said. So uh, let me just try to pick one from each. So Rochelle, um, I absolutely agree. I mean, primarily, it's the domestic law of the whole state, which serves as the sort of perhaps standard against which, especially in FET, you would assess uh, expectations of the investor. Now, whether, however, FET actually um, commits you to protect legitimate expectations when they are legitimate and uh, so on and so forth, that, that's a very complex question. And then on top of that, even in FET, you would, of course, have um, the general idea of a right to regulate or this um, sort of uh, the, the, the the right of the state to, uh, to protect various types of public interest being recognized. That I think again sort of depends on the individual tribunal looking at this. It depends on the text of the particular treaty. You could, I think, make arguments about systemically integrating um, other sort of pieces of uh, international law, but you know, it's, it's very contextual. So clearly there may be many situations where still um, liability might incur. Um, and and uh, therefore, it, it would have to depend on the individual circumstances. Um, but but I would agree that um, yes, you, you you do have to, especially for a range of specific protections under investment law, also take account of the domestic legal system. But I think I mean it's mainly with regard to expropriation, and that is also correct as you were highlighting that trips and the flexibilities highlighted in trips seem to serve as some sort of a, a uh, like baseline against which at least the expropriation standards are being judged so something which is compliant with trips and one could probably it's probably not completely unsustainable to argue that that includes uh, an agreement you know um, uh, in the wto be it a WTO uh, uh, as an institution decision, albeit an agreement amongst the members to waive trips. And, and then um, if one extrapolates from that, and that's a similar point in FTAs, that in principle, the, the, the common intention of the state parties is perhaps in regards to access to medicines to leave it to the TRIPS flexibilities as the more specific expressions of a right to regulate, then often, not always, but often you could perhaps eventually as a sort of defense 
once you've identified that there's a potential breach of FET or expropriation, you, you could look at the waiver and at least read the sort of otherwise accepted defenses within FTAs or IIAs in light of the waiver. Um, I think I have to leave it at that general level because other than that, we have to look at the specific instance of a particular country taking a particular measure and being bound by particular types of commitments. And that uh, leads over to Holger's point about complexity. Absolutely agree, Holger. That's that's probably the key problem that because of all of these different commitments, they basically accumulate, right? It's, it's basically you're being committed to so many different things. So. Um, if you were to take it very technically, you can only do whatever the, the sort of least common denominator of possible limits and exceptions allows you still to do. But I think here you also have to, that's where we come in with this idea of looking at the waiver as you know, not only technically suspending trips, but actually, you know, the purpose of doing this, of course, is to enable, as the preamble suggests, countries to take certain measures. Now, you might then think about how much you can roll this over into other areas, and that's also where Federica's arguments about consent come in, um, but, but that's probably, you know, again, depending on the individual context. Um, and, and, and Peter, maybe just briefly uh, a comment about, um, is the waiver actually necessary? Um, that's a question we didn't even sort of try to answer really because it's a huge different debate. But I think when we looked at um, sort of in the report, defenses within investment law, within uh, FTAs, references back, back to uh, trips, as I've just mentioned before, that of course would be something you would uh, engage and engage with in the analysis in a particular situation. And it may well be that for the purpose of compliance with an FDA or IIA commitment, you, you don't even need to sort of reference the waiver because the general sort of limits within that type of uh, regime are in itself sufficient. Um, and, and just lastly then, Nehemiah, on the question, uh, I'm just gonna pick the one on the Paris Convention. Um, now, I absolutely agree. And I think we say that in the report as well. Now, um, it, again, while it depends on the individual circumstances, even if we assume that the Paris Convention in, in, in principle remains um, sort of a valid international commitment, even for WTO members, even in the context of being committed to comply within TRIPS, the implications of that for pharmaceutical product, product uh, pr pr protection under patent law would be very limited. You would only be kind of stuck with Article 5A of the Paris Convention when it comes to compulsory licenses for local working. But um, more or less everyone, I think, agrees that it, that is a specific provision dealing with the local working aspect. So another ground for issuing a compulsory license is not implicated by Article 5A. Therefore, I think the, 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 the overall um, implications uh, from being continued to obliga be uh, uh, obligated to comply with Paris are rather limited. Okay, I'll leave it at that and, and um, pass on to Federica. Thank you. Federica. Thank you, Henning. Thank you, Sean. Um, lots of questions and very thought provoking. Um, so I, I'll take them in order. I took copious notes so that I can then remember what everybody said. <laughs> so I'm gonna start off with Daniel. Um, and the point about the application of exceptions and the high threshold for meeting these exceptions. Um, I think you're right that they are, uh, the tribunals have taken a very strict understanding of the internal exceptions and very often have interpreted exceptions within the investment agreements in particular by reference to the much stricter standards of Article 25. Um, th there's been a lot written about this. And I think one thing, one point that perhaps we often forget is that these investment tribunals, especially the ones dealing with the Argentine crisis were the first ever tribunals to apply Article 25, right? Article 25 did not exist until 2001. There's an attempt at application in the Gapchikov and Aguimarish case in 1990, what is it, 1997. But before then, what we have is a mass of cases of states throwing arguments about self-preservation and the need to preserve certain essential interests of the state and tribunals roughly handling these as if they were a claim of force majeure. So really, th these are our guinea pigs on Article 25. And I think that now there is some common understanding about how tribunals ought to do these things. I think there is a clear understanding 
meaning that if there's an essential security exception, you go to that first. You don't need to interpret that in light of Article 25. And I think it is to be expected in the next generation of investment tribunals dealing with these kinds of exceptions, there will be a much clearer contextual and nuanced understanding of how internal exceptions apply and how they relate to the customary defense of necessity on one hand. Why is the defense of necessity strict? Well, historical reasons. There is some connection between the defense of necessity and the right of self-preservation, which was used to a great extent in the 19th century to invade countries. <laughs> so you can see why when the defense of necessity was first formulated in the 20th century, it was necessary to draft it in the strictest possible terms. It is essentially a defense that is invoked unilaterally and you just have to trust the judgment of the state that is invoking the defense at that time in breach of the rights of another state. So it is fundamentally incompatible with the principle of sovereign equality because it allows one state to decide which of its own interests or of another state's interests should be more important in international law. So of course there is reason to draft it restrictively and as restrictively as it has been drafted. I just think that with the crisis that we have been faced since the early 2000s, this type of drafting of necessity has proven to be way too strict and not allow the flexibility that states sometimes need uh, to address their crisis. How do we how do we address that? I don't know. We I, I suggest in an article with Michael Weibel recently that perhaps what we might do is attach an obligation to pay compensation for material loss, allow, for example, a much broader ability to invoke the defense of necessity, but attach a circumstance to it paying compensation, or you could perhaps attach it to a dispute settlement provision so that every, every time a defense of necessity is invoked, there is third party dispute settlement. Now, this is, of course, all normative, all for the future, if there are treaty and responsibilities ever negotiated and doesn't really help us at the moment. It's just, unfortunately, it is currently very strict. Now, on Rochelle's point, I found really interesting the question about what happens when a state suspends or terminates an investment treaty. Can, a, can an investor, can a, a company sue their own state, perhaps domestically, uh, with respect to the termination of that particular agreement? I don't have an answer to this, but the one thought that occurred to me is that there is no obligation on states, for example, to exercise diplomatic protection on behalf of an individual. And so if there is no obligation to espouse their claim, perhaps there is no obligation to maintain their rights at an international level as well. So I wonder if perhaps an answer could come from that angle. But on the specific point, I think it might depend on domestic law and I don't really have an answer for that, but it is actually a really interesting point to raise. Holger complexity. I love it. <laughs> um, I mean, it certainly is what makes this topic so interesting to me as an academic and why when Henning first described the complexity of it, I said I must be a part of this. I don't want to be a policymaker making decisions in this case. And I realized just how difficult it would be. And you're completely right. The, the report tries to sketch a general and abstract line which does not allow really for making predictions of whether a state will or will not face claims in any given case, because it will all turn on the specific treaty in question. You know, it might turn on the arbitrators and what they had for breakfast, right? So, so it, is, it is an incredibly difficult thing, area to, where, to give predictions on. But I think there is a more settled understanding, in particular of, of state of necessity, which might allow some consideration of how these things would apply. I can't comment on the WTO, I'm sorry. I make it my business never to learn anything about WTO law. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I can't say much about how they apply the ILC articles. But as far as I understand, they, they have been very shy, even though in certain circumstances they have said that they apply as part of general international law, nonetheless. Now there was um, the question that uh, Peter asked about, um, do we need the waiver in order for these defenses to apply? And perhaps for necessity, we don't need the waiver at all. A state might simply decide to implement measures that affect IP rights and then just hope that relying on necessity will be sufficient at an international level to do away with the claim. Um, for consent, perhaps we don't need it either. It's just that, of course, in the discussions about the waiver in the WTO, you might find the source of the consent of the state to the non-performance of those obligations. So it makes it a forum where states can express their views and where we can infer consent from. Um, finally, for Narmala, um, you asked the question about non-contribution. You're absolutely right. The way it's drafted, anything the state does can contribute to the situation of necessity. And in particular, in the situation that we've had, where the, we have had waves of the pandemic and measures adopted and removed, sometimes not necessarily responding to scientific evidence, it would make it a nightmare 
for any decision maker to decide exactly what contributes and what does not contribute. Now, one important thing I think to remember about non-contribution, and I didn't mention this in the talk, is that there is no evidence in practice or opinion units to support the non-contribution requirement. This was added by the ILC during the drafting of this provision. And I think some of the reasons why it was added was as, as a way to prevent moral hazard, essentially, just to prevent states from engaging in risky behavior in the knowledge that subsequently they could just put the burden of the cost of that risky behavior onto another state. So it is, it is a reasonable aim. I am not entirely sure that it is necessarily the best way of preventing moral hazard. And I think it is in fact incompatible with the very rationale of the plea. And this is a point that Roberto Ago had made during the drafting of the um, Article 25. Why does it matter whether a state contributed to the situation if ultimately what we want to ensure is that superior interests are not harmed? Are we really going to allow the harming of superior interests because a state contributed to the situation? So it seems completely incompatible with the aim of the plea. And again, in a separate article that I have written on this, we have suggested that perhaps a way of curbing moral hazard is precisely by requiring uh, a payment, com payment of compensation, for example, for material harm after the invocation of the plea. So at that point, you have achieved your aim of protecting superior interest, and then you leave the consequences for later. Um, so these are just very brief reactions to your questions. Of course, there's a lot more to say, um, and I hope that there will be a lot more to say once we enter our broader discussion with the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let me uh, now just give our, our final thanks and, and stop the formal session uh, of this meeting. But Henny and Federico, a fabulous paper. It was, uh, it was really great to have you present it. It, it really stoked um, a lot of interesting discussion and ideas, uh, certainly uh, within my own mind, but obviously within all the, all the commentators as well. Um, and thank you to our panel, uh, to South Center for sponsoring and, and commissioning this paper and helping to co-sponsor this event, uh, to, the, um, uh, to Rochelle and to Peter and to Bulgar and to Numala and Daniel for commenting and for everybody for joining us. So as I mentioned at the onset, this uh, meeting has been recorded and we'll post it the events page at uh, www.pijip.org for your later use. And with that, let me close the, the formal session.